The word rape comes from the Latin word raptus, which means wherein one man damages the property of another man. Uh, even though the criminal justice system in many countries all over the world right now regard rape as a heinous crime, but as far as attitude to rapes are concerned, not much has changed down the ages. I discovered it in a very poignant way 18 years ago. I had gone to a police station and I was waiting for some work to happen. And next to me was sitting a family, a family of four, a father and uh, three children. They looked very traumatized, did not make eye contact with anyone, didn't look up. And I tried to make eye contact with them, they would avoid it. The inspector who was dealing with their case came after some time. He looked at me and said, Dr. Mitra, I'll just be with you in a minute, but first I'll have to talk to them. He looked at them and said, please hurry up, I don't have all day. You tell me what you have to say, otherwise he left the sentence unfinished. The family started crying, and then he turned to me and said, okay, they'll be fine. I was affected. At that time, I was working in Tehar prisons. I was working in a center for mentally disturbed people. I had by and large seen a lot of disturbed behavior. Not much had affected me, but this incident somewhere affected me very deeply. I talked to the inspector. I said, uh, these people seem very traumatized. They can't give a statement right now. So do you think that uh, I could talk to them so that they calm down? Because only then they can give a statement. So he looked at me and said, okay, fine, you go ahead. That makes it, you know, my work a little easier. So I took the purse, you know, I took the family's permission. I asked them if they would like to speak to me. They were too glad to do so. I started speaking to them. And uh, within one hour, I had got enough uh, information from them. And uh, I went back to the police officer. I said, they have given a kind of a statement you can see. He looked at it and said, they should have done that earlier. They wasted my time and your time, everybody's time. Anyway, a few days later, I learned that the suspect was arrested based on that. But this incident disturbed me very deeply. I asked myself, is this what families go through in the worst hour of their life when they go to a police station? Where was compassion? Where was the support that victims need in our country? I went to the police commissioner of Delhi at that time and I spoke to him. I said, can we start a service by which we can reach out to victims of crime? He looked at me a little strangely. He said, sure, you want to go ahead, doctor? Go ahead. Uh, I give you two police stations in south of Delhi. And I, can, I still recall them, Vasant Kunj and Vasant Vihar police station. We visited them every day. For the first six months, police did not refer us any case. They just did not believe in it frankly. They said, you know, you are interfering in our work. <coughs> we will not uh, in any way, you know, be enhanced by it. Another six months passed, and we thought that our program had fizzled out, but it didn't. On, in the 11th month, there was this girl who was referred to us. She was 13 years old, mentally challenged, spoke very little, and she was assaulted when she was going for defecation in the morning. And this, I must say this, a large number of women in our country are assaulted when they go for defecation, right? And sexual assault is something that takes place when women are going for defecation. It takes place in toilets. It takes place in holy places like churches, mosques, temples, everywhere. There is no place which I have not seen where sexual assaults do not take place. Anyway, we went to this girl and we found that she lived with her mother, very poor. She had just one room to live in. She didn't talk much. She would just look and uh, look blankly at us. My colleague said, what do I do? I said, hold her hand, right? That's the best that we could do. On the third day, okay, I can see the bang upstairs, yeah. <laughs> so on the third day, she, we were talking that she hasn't given any information to the perpetrator, he would get away. And uh, she was keenly listening. And then something happened. She pointed her finger at my ankle and said, Tarwa. That's all. 
we asked her mother, has she ever used this word? Mother said, no, she hasn't ever used this word. Does anyone by that name live somewhere around? Mother said, no, I have never that. We thought it is something that just a fancy or something of imagination. She again pointed out, Tarwa, you know, look, when we were discussing about the case, you know, about the perpetrator getting away, right? I talked to my friend, he was a ENT specialist. I said, there is this girl who's like this. She hears very little, talks very little. How do we do it? He says, can I come and see her? He came with us, he saw her, and then he said, she hears very few frequencies. And this word stands for something else, I can find out. And then he talked to her and said, the word somewhere means probably J and Le, so you can say Jalwa. Right? Now, this wasn't of much use either. We asked people, no help. Then somebody gave us a clue. They said, at the far end of the slum, there is a boy who lives by the name of Kalu. He's also known as Jalva because his ankle is burnt over here. That's what he is known as. We got him. When the girl saw him, she pointed her finger like this and started shivering, right? The boy confessed to his crime. I'm calling him a boy. He was 19 years old. And he told us that because this girl does not speak, she, he thought that he would get away, right? But he didn't. Our next problem was, how do we prove it in the court? The defense lawyer, when he saw all this, laughed at it. He said, this case won't last. She can't even talk. And Justice uh, Santosh Singh Man, one of India's most well-known judges, was hearing the case. We, we, we really went ahead and prepared her. Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional because I'm getting into it. We prepared her. We said, in the same way you told us this, in the same way you have to say it in the court, right? She briefly nodded her head. On the appointed day, she went. The judge took her, listened to her, and I think she guessed our uncertainty, our doubts. I think we were more scared than she was. And she, when she had to pronounce the judgments sometimes later, she said, in my whole life, I have never been more convinced about the testimony of any victim and the guilt of any suspect. I sentence him, right? That was our first case. And after that, we started getting more cases because it got more known, right? What I want to say here is that what is trauma? Trauma is something which is an overwhelming event that affects us, our thoughts, our feelings, our behavior, right? For example, Right now, the loud thunder you heard, if it was a little more louder, some of us would have run away. If there was an earthquake here, all of us would run away, right? So it's an overwhelming event that affects our perceptions, our memory, and fragments it. As I look back, I see that we have dealt with more than 8,000 people so far on their trauma of all kinds, sexual assault, homicide, terrorism. I'll just pick up a few cases because this is on sexual violence. One of the first women that we dealt with, it was very strange. A woman professor from Delhi University was going back to her home when she noticed a girl standing on the balcony, quiet, not looking anywhere, her eyes fixed. She was around 14 years of age. She wrote to the police saying that I find something odd over here. Now that's a responsibility of a citizen. You see something odd, please inform. That is why perpetrators cannot function. The police talked to her. The DCP of that uh, Devesh Srivastava was a very sensitive officer. He called us. He said, Rajat, we have spoken to her. We have not found anything. But will you talk to her? We and I and my you know, colleague, a woman, we went there. It was at Dholakma police station. Uh, we talked to her. We found nothing. And we were almost coming to the close of the session. It was a January evening. And I noticed that she was very cold. And in our uh, office car, there were always woolens that were kept, because we often came across people who needed woolens. So I told my colleague that, will you take her and give her some socks and something? I mean, uh, maybe she needs to clad. When he came back, my colleague's face was changed. She said, this girl is 13 years old, but her body language is very different. I cannot place it, but there is something very odd about it. I said, what is odd? She said, you know, it's almost like she's walking like a dancer. 
So I said, maybe we can ask her. You ask her. She was doing the session. Are you a dancer? She asked. Yes. OK, you dance when there is nobody at home. She says, no, I dance in front of people. What do you mean you dance in front of people? She says, people come to my home, my uncle and aunt with whom I live, they bring people, I dance in front of them, they throw coins at me. Why didn't you tell the police? So far better. Because nobody asked me. Right? It is simple. It's a simple point of observing something and asking. Meanwhile, her uncle and aunt, who were sitting outside the police station, ran away. Right? She went ahead, testified in the courts about her and uncle and aunt, who were running a trafficking a business with her and with other girls. This girl taught us a very important lesson that the trauma of a woman after sexual assault lies in her body. The crime scene is the woman's body. It is not outside. And I gave a talk to the Delhi police officers at that time. I said, when you investigate rape cases, please go ahead and talk to the woman, see the woman, how her body has been affected. They were not doing that. Even if there were injury marks, they would routinely ignore it. Right? It's, as, it's as basic as that. There was another case I remember which taught us a very important lesson, and that is that the need for justice is innate in human beings. Even after years have passed, people don't forget. We had a girl who was around 17 years of age. A case of 354 was lodged. For those of you who don't know, 354 is violence against uh, a woman's uh, body and outraging her modesty. Uh, when we were talking to her, she talked about how her, uh, how her um, uh, father used to abuse her many years ago, and yes, it was sexual abuse. Why didn't you tell it? My father wouldn't let me come out. Why are you telling it now? She said, because I feel that he will go after my sister. My sister is growing up, and therefore he's doing that. We said, well, we need to inform this. The police dissuaded us. It's an old case. It happened seven years back. There is no evidence. I asked the girl, I said, do you want to still go ahead? She nodded her head, yes. We took the risk. Everybody laughed at us. They said, well, it's not going to work out. But the fact is that there is power in the testimony of the victim. She stood her ground, even though one of the best uh, lawyers was appointed by her father to defend. She went ahead and spoke it in the court, and she got her father arrested because she did not want her sister to suffer the same fate that she had gone. Right? The need for justice, that's innate. The third case, which I recall from our first year, was about a visa officer. And I want to talk about how memory fragments us. Uh, we were sitting with her, and she was trying to make the face of the person who had assaulted her. After some unsuccessful attempt, she said, Doctor, uh, I'm very good at recognizing faces. I give visas to people. If I refuse a visa to a person, I remember it. So even after two years, if that person applies again with a mustache, with a changed face, with everything else, I know I can spot him. But why I'm feeling depressed right now is I cannot recall anything about the faces of the man who assaulted me just a few hours ago. That is what trauma does to our memory, get fragmented. I was speaking to a girl again, trying to get details of the perpetrator, and she said, I'm very good in recalling people, but right now I can't recall anything because I can only recall the handle of the knife that he put over here, and she pointed like this just the handle. I cannot recall anything about him. That is what trauma does to us. That is what trauma does to people. OK. This is a drawing made by a survivor. It shows how her life, the foundation is gone. That's, it's broken. In our study, we found, we did a study that these are some of the symptoms that victims of sexual assault have after they go through a trauma. They go through a of trauma, as you can see, flashbacks body image disturbances, dehumanization. This was a letter written to us by the police commissioner. It said, because you created a right environment, therefore the victim got help and the, uh, the perpetrator could be affected. We did a study to find out about how people get affected. And what we found is very poignant and interesting. 
and that is that women get affected despite race, background, class. The daughter of a laborer living under a bridge suffers the same amount of trauma as someone living in a palace. There is no difference. And this is a myth that percolates down to judges, police officers everywhere. Oh, she's a married woman, so therefore she would have less trauma than an unmarried woman. Why? Because rape is associated, the trauma of it, with loss of virginity. No. It is associated with loss of will. When you are overpowered, at that moment, what you go through is the most traumatic. We found that across different, whether urban and rural women, there were no difference. They all scored high. Individual and gang rape, we found that the trauma by women faced is almost the same. Different age groups, whether the woman is 16 or 60, there is not much difference. They both score high. It has got nothing to do with you are married or what's your age. Trauma remains frozen across time. So whether it's in the immediate aftermath or after several years, there is no change. One area we found different, and that was Dalit versus non-Dalit in our group. Dalit women scored far more trauma, and that is what puzzled us. Why? When we went to see, we found that when Dalit women are assaulted, women from their community get together and tell them about the trauma that their entire community have gone through over the centuries. The fatalism gets collected. The trauma of a single Dalit is the trauma of the whole Dalit community. That's something that we find very poignantly, and that is something she passes on to the next generation. The trauma of Dalit women is transgenerational, goes across from generation to generation. And yes, there is one difference we found with Dalit women who were assaulted, and that's it. We all know that there is untouchability in our country. It extends in every area. It does not extend to rape. It doesn't. Upper caste people who assault Dalit women have no reservations about raping Dalit women. I, I had a man who had assaulted a woman and he wanted water. And when the water came, he said, he's from a lower caste. Can you have a higher caste man give water to me? And I said, you assaulted a Dalit woman. How come he smiled and he said, well, you know, he didn't say anything. He turned his face away, All right? Okay, this is a Dalit hamlet. And this is where an infamous sexual assault took place. Can you see that the grass is cut and there is grass on the side? It was cut because when we visited the place. Because Dalit women are assaulted over here on the way. And it was done by uh, the Thakurs of that area who wanted to prevent an assault. So when they got to know that we are coming, they cut down the grass. Okay, this was a picture given by a victim of a gang rape. The left-hand side was when she was lying in the hospital bed. That's her picture, you can see, right? And the right-hand side is where she drew after a year. When I asked her that if, for example, we hadn't met you, how would it have been? How would the right-hand side have been? Would it have been like this? She said, no. I said, how would it have been? She cut off and said, there would have been no picture. You understand what that means? This is another picture, the last picture that I want to show, that you can see how this girl has drawn her back and how she feels the sun coming out. That's hope and uh, joy after suffering and assault. Women suffer trauma, and women become silent after trauma. And that silence is not their responsibility. That is the responsibility of the society. The society, until unless it creates safe institutions, criminal justice institutions that can address and her trauma, the women will not come forward to speak. And it is important that we, as a rule of law society, must create those institutions so women in our country and other countries do speak up. That's what I want to say. Thank you.